I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. So Genesis chapter 32, we'll read 32 and 33 real quick, and then we'll uh, dig into it. Quite an interesting chapter here before us as we uh, continue to look at the life of Jacob. It says in Genesis chapter 32, verse 1, So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messages, messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Asir, uh, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that my that I find favor um, in your sight. Verse 6, Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, uh, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him um, and the flocks and the herds and camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to uh, the one company and attacks it, then the other company, which is left, will escape. Then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all of the mercies and of all of the truth which you have shown uh, your servants, for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have come to company two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of your brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children." For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, uh, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand um, as a present for Esau, his brother. 200 female goats and 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 40 female donkeys and 10 foals. Verse 16, then he delivered them to the hand of his servants, uh, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between uh, successive droves. And he commanded uh, the first one, saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Uh, whose are these in front of you? Then you shall say, they are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second and the third and all who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. And also say, Behold, your servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, I will appease him with the present uh, that goes before me, and afterwards I will see his face, perhaps he will accept me. So he presented, uh, so the pr so the present went, over, went on over before him, but he himself lodged there uh, that night in the camp. Verse 22, And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of uh, Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and, and sent over what he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob. Up, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. And he said, Why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place uh, Peniel, uh, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. 
Just as he crossed, crossed over Penuel, uh, the sun rose on him, uh, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. 32 or 33 1 says, Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400. Uh, men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants, and he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he, ga until he came near to his brother. Verse 4, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, who are these with you? So he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maid servants came near, uh, they and their children, and they bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children and they bowed down afterwards. Um, Joseph and Rachel came near and they bowed down. Then Esau said, what do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, there, these are uh, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my presence uh, from my hand. And as much as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God and you were pleased with me, please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey, uh, let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds um, are nursing, and that are with me. And if they, and if the men should drive them um, hard one day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servants. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock uh, that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and Seir. And Esau said, now let me leave with you some of my people who are with me. But he said, what need is there? Uh, let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to uh, Succoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called um, Succoth. Verse 18, then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city, and he, brought the, and he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, a Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. Then he erected an altar and called it El El Ho uh, Israel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this evening. And God, I ask that as we uh, look at uh, more of Jacob's life tonight, God, uh, that we could uh, really just relate with it, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord, through your word. Um, God, I just ask that uh, uh, your Holy Spirit would be here tonight to minister to each and every one of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week we had the great Awana Awards Night and it went really well um, and I'm glad we were able to, uh, to have that program here. But two weeks ago when we were in Genesis chapter uh, 31, we saw that the Lord uh, spoke to Jacob and he let him know it was time to leave um, serving his uncle Laban. He served for a total of 20 years, uh, seven years for his first wife, seven years for his second wife, and then six years for the livestock. God tells him, hey, it's time to, to go back home to the land of your father. So he gets them all together, and Jacob leaves with his family without telling his uncle Laban. Laban finds out three days later, he takes off after him. He finally catches up to Jacob, and he chews Jacob out a little bit. He's not exactly happy with all the choices Jacob made. And they, they have this little tuffle back and forth, and then they finally decide to make a covenant with each other. So they, they, they build this altar, and Laban goes, look, this side's mine, that side's yours. As long as you stay on your side and I stay on my side, we're going to get along. So that's kind of where we left off two weeks ago. So Jacob is still on his way back to um, the land of his fathers, uh, trying to obey what God has told him to do. 
In uh, chapter 32, verse 1, it says, So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Mm. Here's Jacob. He's continuing on his way back to uh, where God wants him to be, and, and he sees that there's angels encamped around him. Interesting thing. Why are these angels around him? We'll find out here in a little bit. Verse 2 says, When Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place uh, Mahan Aim. And that Mahan Aim, it means um, two camps or double camps. So, so he, he sees the angels are camped and also he's camped. So he goes, I'm going to call this place double camped because we're both camping here together. Why are these angels camped around Jacob? I would suggest it's because Jacob feared God. Did Jacob fear God perfectly? No, he didn't fear him perfectly, but he feared God. And this is why the angels are there. Because in Psalm 34, verse 7, it says, The angels of God, or of the Lord, encamp around um, all those who fear him, and he delivers them. So the reason why Jacob sees these angels is because he's fearing God, he's respecting God, and God is protecting him with these angels. This is kind of significant because Jacob sees these angels at a time in his life when he really needs comfort. He's been kicked out of, um, he, he's cut ties with his uncle where he's lived for the past 20 years. And he's now going back to his homeland where he didn't leave on the best terms. So, so he's not quite sure what's going to be waiting there. And, and God allows him to see the spiritual and realize that there's all of these heavenly beings protecting him. We see this in other places in the Bible, such as in 2 Kings chapter 6, when Elisha uh, is getting ready to go into battle and the odds are not in his favor at all. And God allows Elijah's eyes to be open and he sees all of these chariots of angels surrounding him and he prays that his men would be able to see it too and they do and then he prays that the enemy won't and it's an awesome thing that we see and I believe this happens in our lives as well and I've never I've never been blessed with the opportunity to see uh, angels camped around me or around anyone but that doesn't mean that they're not there we see them in the Old Testament and I believe they they still exist today to uh, to protect us Verse 3 goes on to say, Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So Jacob's got some of his men, and he decides to send them ahead and to kind of scope out the land and kind of test the waters and let uh, kind of figure out what's going on with Esau. Verse 4, And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. So Jacob is coaching his servants on exactly what to say. Here's what I want you to say. Refer to Esau as Lord. Refer to me as servant, right? He's making it very clear because they had some issues. So he goes, I want him to understand that I'm humble, that I am, him, that I am his servant, that I'm willing to, to see him as the authority in my life. Verse 5, he says, I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants, and I have sent to all my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. So he's going to send all these animals to his older brother in hopes that his older brother uh, will not hate him. If you guys remember back in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, the last thing we see Esau saying is it says, So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of Morning for my father are at hand, then I will kill my brother Jacob. So the last thing Jacob remembers Esau saying is, I'm going to kill you as soon as dad dies. Now, uh, Rachel um, told Jacob, the son, that, that I'm going to send for you when your brother calms down. It's been 20 years, and nowhere do we have recorded that she sent for him. All we see is that God told him it's time to go back. So he's not sure, is mom and dad still alive? Is, Jacob's, is Esau still mad at me? I'm not sure what the situation that I'm walking in is, but he's at least honoring God and, and trying to go back to his homeland. Verse 6, then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, we came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Mm, this is not what Jacob wants to hear. They're like, okay, we found Esau, and he's actually on his way to find you, and by the way, he's got 400 men with him. It's like, Jacob's got to be like, oh gosh, what am I about to get myself into? Because Jacob doesn't have 400 men. He's got a lot of animals, as we see, and he's got his family and a few other servants probably, right, a lot of kids, but he doesn't have... Uh, 
uh, he's not ready to battle, and he, he's got to be worried at this point. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he uh, divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. He gets word that his brother's coming after him with 400 men, and he's trying to think fast. He goes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to split everything that I have in two. Why is he doing this? Verse 8, and he said, if Esau comes uh, to one company and attacks, then the other company which is left will escape. He goes, look, I'd rather lose half of what I have than all of what I have, so I'm going to split up what I have, people and animals, and if he kills one, I'll at least have the other half of the other. Logically, in a human mindset, it makes sense, but it's maybe a little selfish. You know, these are his kids and wives that he's talking about. Right. Verse 9 says, then uh, Jacob said, O God, my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. Notice, Jacob gets word, Esau's after him, 400 men. First thing he does is everything that he can think of. He divides everyone up, and then after he's done what he can think of, then he chooses to pray. Maybe the wrong order of things, right? But it's probably the, uh, a way that we can very much relate with. Often uh, we get overwhelmed with a situation. We're like, okay, this is just what I'm going to do. And after we do everything that our mind can think of, then we're like, oh yeah, God, by the way, uh, help me out here. And it's like, yeah, maybe we should, we should pray first and see what God would have us do in the situation instead of doing all we can and then praying. Verse 10 goes on to say, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truths which you have shown your servant. For I've crossed over the Jordan with my staff, and now I have come to companies. We see Jacob here very humbled before God. He's like, look, I I'm not even worthy of all the mercies and all the truth and all the blessings that you've given me. When I left this land, when I crossed the Jordan River, all I had was a staff in my hand. And now when I'm coming back, I have two companies, two groups of, of animals and family, and God has just really blessed Jacob. Jacob throughout these 20 years. Verse 11, so he prays to the Lord, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, so what, for I fear him, lest he comes and attacks me, and the mother with the children. As he's praying, he's just very honest with God, which I can appreciate. He's like, look, Lord, I'm afraid that my brother might just kill me. But there in verse 11, it's interesting because, look, I'm afraid for my own life, he says, and I'm also afraid for the mother with the children. Not the mothers. He's got plenty. He's got four mothers, actually, but he appears to only pray for one. And it's interesting because, if, okay, which one is he praying for? You default and think Rachel, but she actually only has one kid, and he says children. So maybe he's praying for Leah because he knows that that's the line that the Messiah is going to come through. We're not exactly sure. Maybe he just misspoke and, and said it really quickly, but, but he does use the singular on the woman and the plural on the children. Verse 12 says, For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. Jacob, as he's praying to the Lord, notice what he says. He says, for you said, and he reminds God of the promise that God has made to him many years previously. Does God need to be remembered? No, but it's okay to do this in our own prayer life. It can very much encourage us when we're down and out to pray the word of God, what God has told us back to him. God, you say in your word that if you begin a good work, you're going to complete it. That can comfort us when we speak what God has spoken to us back to him. So Jacob does this. He goes, look, God, you've promised me that, that, that my descendants will be as the sand of the sea. So I don't think you're going to, to allow my brother to kill me. I just don't know what my options are. Verse 13. So he lodged there that same night and he took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. So Jacob stays the night and he's going to sort through his animals and send um, a present forward to his brother. Verse 14, this is what he sends Esau, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. So this is a total of 550 animals, not counting the colts of the camels, because we don't know how many there are, it just says colts. But 550 animals he's taking out of his herd and sending forward to give to Esau, hoping that when Esau gets all these animals from his brother, he won't be mad at him anymore. He's like, maybe if I give him some of my stuff, he won't try to kill me. 
Verse 6, then he delivered them uh, to the hands of, this, of his servants, every drove by itself. And he said to his servants, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. So each group he divides up and he wants distance in between them. So it's just like, okay, this group gets to Esau and then this group will come and then not shortly this one and this one. And it's kind of just this process until all 550 animals had made it to his brother. Verse 19, and he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose uh, are these in front of you? Then you shall say, they are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my Lord Esau. And behold, uh, he also is behind us. So here's what you say when you reach my brother Esau. All these animals come from me, Jacob, and let him know that I'm coming behind him, that, that, that I'm on my way. Um, so kind of prepare him, he's saying. Verse 19, so he uh, commanded the second and the third and all who followed the drove saying, in this manner, you shall speak to Esau when you find him. So he rehearsed it over each one. He goes, this is what you're to say to my brother when you encounter him. Verse 20, and also say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him uh, with the present that goes before me, and afterwards I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So he, uh, so the presence went on over uh, before him, uh, but he himself lodged that night in the camp. So they send out. Jacob stays there. He camps there for the night, but he doesn't get a very good night's sleep, as we're going to see. Verse 22 goes on to say. And he arose that night, and he took his two wives, uh, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and he crossed over the ford of uh, Jabok. So he's camping there on this side of the river. He gets up, though, at night, and he decides, I want to go to the other side, actually. So he crosses over with his family, and he goes to the other side. Verse 23, and he took them, and he set them over the brook, and he uh, sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. So it's actually, he's on one side. He's, he goes over here with his family and moves them. But then it appears that he comes back over on the other side to be alone. So his family's all over here. He's over here alone. Uh, then Jacob was left alone. Uh, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Hmm. Here's Jacob. It's nighttime, he's alone on the other side of the river, and he wrestles with what the Bible says in this verse, a man, until the break of day. Meaning all night long, Jacob is wrestling with someone. <sighs> Who here is Jacob wrestling with? First of all, notice Jacob... Well, I'll spoil it for you. Jacob's wrestling with God, and I'll build my point on why that is. But first of all, notice when Jacob wrestles with God... One of the keys to it is that he got alone. And I think that's something that we need to uh, come away with from this. Oftentimes, the battle happens when we're alone. And a lot of our problems is we don't like being alone. Because it's, it's when we're alone, it's when we are truly who we are. And we're not putting on a show for anyone. It's just us and God. And we have the opportunity to, to wrestle with God, if you will. And God's able to do great works when we're alone with him as he's trying to, to figure stuff out uh, in our life. Notice also it says that he wrestles with him until the break of day, meaning that God is wrestling with Jacob all night long. And in this, we see God's patience because if God wanted to, he could have just pinned Jacob just like that, right? But God is being patient. He's being long suffering with Jacob, going back and forth with him in order to um, ultimately build him up uh, for the future. In uh, Psalm 103, verse 8, it says, The Lord is merciful and, grace, and gracious, slow to anger, and um, abounding in mercy. Now, you talked about how uh, Jacob is wrestling with God. Why do you think Jacob is wrestling with God? Because later on in the Old Testament, in the book of Hosea, chapter 12, verses 2 through 6, we have a little bit of a commentary, if you will, on this passage. And this is what uh, the book of Hosea tells us. It says, The Lord also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will uh, re recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb and in his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel. He struggled with God. 
Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him, and he found him in Bethel. And there he spoke to us. That is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorial name. Uh, so you, uh, by the help of your God, return, um, observe mercy and justice, and wait on your God continually. So this person, this man that Jacob wrestles with is indeed God. I would say it's the angel of the Lord. It's the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ in a man form who's wrestling with Jacob all night long. Now there's some people uh, who, when they read this, see it as just maybe spiritually that there's not actually a physical wrestling match taking place, but I think it means what it says it means. I think a man, Jesus in the form of a man, is wrestling with Jacob as a man all night long. Verse 25 goes on to say, uh, now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Here they are wrestling back and forth all night long and, and finally God reaches out and he touches Jacob's hip and as soon as he does, uh, his hip just goes um, out of joint, out of socket. If you've ever had that happen, I'm sure it's not very comfortable. I haven't had it happen, but if you ever have, yeah, I'm sure it's not fun. Uh, verse 26, and he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Fascinating. Jacob's got a hold of the Lord here and he's going, and, and, and the Lord is saying, let me go. And Jacob's go, I am not going to let you go unless you bless me. We see a, a, a very good picture here of uh, uh, it's a good demonstration of, of, of earnestly seeking God out in prayer. Um, entirely, that's not exactly what's happening because they actually are, are wrestling here. But um, it, it's important to, 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 you don't want to make ultimatums with the Lord, but to come to God and say, Lord, I'm going to spend however long it takes in your word and praying to you until I hear from you. Whether if it's five minutes or five hours, I'm going to set time aside to seek your face, to seek your will, to have you bless me, to, to, to have an experience with the creator of the universe. And I'm willing to wait and sit and wait and, and just see what happens. But eventually, uh, you'll hear from him as you study his word and pray to him. So Jacob, he's holding on to the Lord and he goes, look, God, I'm not letting go until you bless me. Uh, verse 27, so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Here we see that God changes. And again, this is why we think it's God, because he right there says, look, you've been wrestling with God and with man, but you've prevailed. You've, you've made it through the night. The wrestling, the Lord goes, what's your name? He knows his name, but he wants Jacob to say it. Why does he want Jacob to say it? Could it be a play on events what happened 20 plus years earlier when his father said, what is your name? And he said, I'm Esau. So now we see God here repeating the words of his father, what is your name? And he goes, I'm Jacob. He's very honest with the Lord. I, I'm, 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 I'm a heel catcher. And he goes, your name shall no longer be called Jacob but Israel, because you've prevailed uh, with God, uh, because you've wrestled with God and you've prevailed. So your name is no longer heel catcher, but your name is now governed by God. Hmm, what a nice name change, right? Some teenagers go through this phase when they want to change their names. They don't like what their parents call them and they want, to, they want their name to be something cool. Uh, what a great name change the Lord gives Jacob. And God is kind of in the business of changing names. He did it with Peter. He did it with Paul. Uh, the Bible talks about how we're going to have new names. Um, and, and it's really neat uh, that we see God go, you know what? This is who you've been, but this is who you are in me. You're not a heel catcher, but you're governed by me. Uh, verse 29, then Jacob asked saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So he, Jacob tells him his name. He gets his name changed. And he's like, well, what's your name? And God's like, why do you ask me for my name? And then God blesses him. Verse 30, so Jacob called the name of that place uh, Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So that word Peniel means uh, face to face, so he sees God face to face, uh, so he names that place that. Verse 31, just as he crossed over to Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped 
on his hip. Uh, Penuel and penile is the same word. It's just spelled a little differently, but it means the same. Um, and we see Jacob here kind of looping off into the distance. Verse 32. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, uh, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Until which day? What's that verse referring to? I believe it was probably Moses who made that note. As Moses is penning Genesis, he recounts, look, even to this day, to Moses' day, the, the children of Israel do not eat uh, that section of the animal. Now, it's, it's important to note that God never commanded them not to do it. You don't find it anywhere in the Bible, God saying, don't eat the hip of the animal. It just says that the people chose not to do it, which shows us that this event played a big role in their tradition. So they're like, look... Uh, we're not going to eat the, the, the hip of the animal as a representation of God uh, crippling our ancestor in order to uh, get his attention, ultimately. Jacob here is permanently disabled as a reminder to him uh, that he is to be submitted to the Lord, and Jacob was humbled by God. So every single day now for the rest of Jacob's life, every time he takes a step, He's reminded of this evening. He's reminded of this event when he wrestled with the Lord. And I was listening to, a couple years ago, a, a pastor from Denver whose name is Tom Stipe, and he was talking about how in ministry, he never trusts anyone who doesn't have a limp. <laughs> Don't trust anyone who doesn't have a limp, who hasn't wrestled with God, who hasn't wrestled with God and prevailed because they're not worth your time. You want people that have really dug in and who have been with the Lord and who have uh, been humbled by God. So look for that spiritual limp in people. It's a good sign, actually. So he has this rough night. His servants are ahead with his animals to his brother Esau. And we're going to about to see what takes place next in chapter 33. Verse 1 says, Now Jacob lifted his eyes, and he looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He lifts up his eyes. Esau's within seeing distance now. Here's Esau coming towards Jacob, and he sees 400 men. So Jacob decides to divide up his family. And he put the maidservants and the children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Jacob last. <laughs> Do you get what he's doing? Oh, and Joseph, yeah, last. What is he doing here? He's going, he's, right, he's playing favorites, first of all. He goes, oh, okay, uh, maidservants and uh, your kids. He's like, I'm just randomly picking people. Like, I don't have a plan. You guys go first. And then uh, how about Lee in the middle and Rachel and Joseph, I guess you can be in the back, right? And we'll just see what happens. And in case for some reason you guys die, at least Rachel and Joseph are last. <laughs> yeah, good idea there. Verse three, then he crossed over before them. And he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. He crosses over, and at least he's noble. He gets in front of them now, and he's the first one. And he sees Esau coming towards him, and Jacob just starts bowing to the ground seven times. Now, historically, we understand that that's um, how people would bow down to a king. So Jacob is very much just completely submitting himself to his brother. He's saying, look, I'm your servant. I receive your authority, and, and I don't want any trouble. And he just keeps bowing down seven times before his brother as he's coming towards him. Verse 4, But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Wow, not the greeting Jacob was, was planning on. He, he was expecting this big fight, this big battle, and, and when Esau finally gets to him, he just hugs him and starts to cry. Now at this point, Jacob is extremely relieved, but he's probably thinking, Wow, I've just been worried for the past how long for nothing. Does that ever happen with you? You spent sleepless nights and all this time worrying about what might happen, and then it happens, and you're like, is that it? Is, is that all that's happening? And it's like, yeah. And it's like, why did I waste so much time, so much energy, so many sleepless nights worrying about this thing, especially for Jacob when God told him that he would take care of him, when God was the one who told him to go back to his land, and it's like, look, if God tells us to do something, guess what? He's going to preserve his word. He's going to do what he says, and we don't have to fret about it. We don't have to worry about it. We can trust what God tells us. 
Verse 5, he hears Esau, he, he hugs his brother, and he looks up, and all of a sudden, here's all these different groups of people coming towards him. And Esau, uh, he lifts his eyes, and he saw women and children, and he said, who are these with you? He's like, who are all these people trailing behind you in these different groups? And uh, he said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Mm. He goes, Esau, this is my family. This is the, this is the kids that, that God has blessed me with. Verse 6, then the maidservants came near uh, and their children, and they bowed down. And Leah also came near, near with her children, and they bowed down. And afterwards, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. So because they're in different groups, they're slowly catching up to, to Jacob. And as each one gets there, they bow down as well, showing uh, respect to Esau. Uh, then Esau in verse 8 says, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. Esau's like, What's the point of all these animals you sent before? And Jacob's like, Well, it's because I wanted to find favor in, in you. I, I wanted to, to make amends. Verse 9, But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. He was like, I don't want your animals. I don't need 550 animals. I, I got my own herds. I, I have everything that I need. Uh, don't forget, as Jacob's been away for 20 years, Esau's been with his father, uh, Isaac, for 20 years, probably building up a herd and doing extremely well um, as God is, is blessing uh, them as well. Verse 10, and Jacob said, no, please. If I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present uh, from my hand, and as much as I have seen your face, as though I had seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Jacob here draws a parallel between the face of Esau and the face of God. He goes, no, 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 please take this, because as I'm seeing your face, I've also seen the face of God. What's he talking about here? He could be referring to the fact of, um, look, God has shown me unconditional mercy, and right now Esau is too. Because Esau could still be extremely upset, but he chooses to be gracious. It also could be that Jacob is saying, look, I, I'm realizing by the expression on your face that the only reason why you're not killing me right now is because God has changed your mind. So, so in your expression, in your face, I, it's like I, I, I see God like I saw him last night. There's something different about you. Your, your mind, your uh, view of me has changed. Uh, verse 12, then Esau said, let us take our journey. Let us go and I will go before you. So they're not, um, they're not in Shechem yet. Uh, they meet out away and they go, well, let's, let's, let's travel together. Esau goes to Jacob, let's, let's caravan together. But Jacob, or Esau is actually not going to go to Shechem, as we'll see, verse 13. But Jacob said to him, uh, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and the herds which are nursing are with me. And uh, if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Esau goes, look, Jacob, let's, uh, let's travel together. Jacob's like, ah, you know, I'd like to. And he makes some excuses. He goes, look, the kids are little. They can't keep up, says 87-year-old Jacob, who's now limping, right? And he's using the kids as the excuse. Yeah, the kids probably won't be able to, you know, make it. Whatever. And then he's like, and the animals also, because they're, they're young and they're nursing, and if, if they push them too hard, just one day they could all die. So he's like, you know, you guys just go ahead, and, and we'll catch up to you. Uh, eventually. Verse 14, he says, please let my Lord go ahead before his servant and I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock uh, that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. So Esau is going to Seir and uh, Jacob is not going to go there. And you can kind of read this passage in a couple different ways. Either Jacob is being deceitful again, because he's very much making it sound like uh, he's going to catch up eventually, but we'll see he actually ends up heading in the opposite direction. Uh, maybe he had good intentions, and for whatever reason, he chose to change his mind. I don't know, but, but he tells his brother he's going to catch up with him, and he actually doesn't. Uh, 15, so Esau said, now let me uh, leave with you some of the people who were with me. But he said, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. Esau, and I think Esau knows his brother, right? So, so Esau is like, 
you don't want to just travel together? Jacob's like, oh, no, I'll just catch up. He goes, well, how about I leave some of my guys behind to help you? I mean, you got a lot of animals. And Jacob's like, oh, don't bother with that. I mean, we'll take care of it. We'll, we'll, we'll catch up. J- just take on your way. Go on, go on your way. Verse 16, so Esau returned that day on his way to uh, Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Succoth. He built himself a house, and he made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called a Succoth. Seir is south, Succoth is north, literally the exact opposite direction from where he told his brother he was going to go. And he probably started in that direction as they can kind of see him, and then all of a sudden he's like, okay, we're turning around, and they go now back (laughs) into a different direction, back towards Succoth. And notice when he gets there, uh, he builds a house, he builds uh, some booths, some barns, if you will, for his animals. Verse 18, then Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, uh, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram, and he pitched his tent before the city. So Jacob makes it back to Shechem, finally. Um, he pitches his tent. Verse 19, and he bought the parcel of land where he had pitched his tent from the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for 100 pieces of money. He pitches his tent, he buys some land, he, he, things are really going well for him. Verse 20, then he erected an altar there and called it El Elhor, uh, Elho Israel, which means God, the God of Israel. So it's like a double God, the God of Israel, uh, signifying that, that he's building this uh, altar to the one who he wrestled with. Now, this is interesting because... First of all, Jacob builds an altar in the same place that his grandfather Abraham did. So it's actually quite possible because of the words that are used here, um, they're different than to just like build an altar. It, it might actually mean that he reconstructed the altar that Abraham once made back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 through 7, when he was there in that same place. Um, I would, I think though, and, and I'll, I'll prove this more next week, that Jacob is here in Shechem, but I don't think that's where he's supposed to stay. I think he's supposed to go to Bethel. And because Jacob chooses to stay in Shechem and not go to Bethel, because he made that compromise, we're going to see next week in chapter 34, some pretty bad things happen to his family. In uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse 1, if you just want to look ahead there, It says, then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And then back in Genesis 28, verses 18 through 22, where we see Jacob first there at Bethel, it says, Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stones that he had put uh, at his head. He set it up in a pillar and he poured oil on it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me, this is 20 years earlier, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a 10th to you. So back in Genesis 28, 20 years previously, Jacob makes a, a covenant with the Lord. Look, if you take care of me, You will be my God, I'll give you a tenth, and Bethel will be known as your house. In Genesis 35, we're going to see that God's going to tell uh, Jacob to go to Bethel. But right now, we're going to see him settle for Shechem. And in our own life, we can do this a lot, because settling in Shechem is a compromise. And in his compromise, he tries to justify it by building an altar there. Well, I'm not in Bethel, I'm in Shechem, but, but here's an altar, right? I'm not doing exactly what God wants me to do, but, but look at what I've done. Look at this altar that I've made. 
It's like, well, that's cute. But what has God told you to do? Right? If he wants you in Bethel, I don't really care about your altar in Shechem. How about we get to Bethel? Because if he would have just went to Bethel, chapter 34 wouldn't have happened, and his daughter Dinah wouldn't have been raped, as we're going to look at next week. Some pretty bad things happen because he chooses to stay in this land instead of going to the house of God. A lot of Christians, a lot of backsliding Christians, Bethel, the house of God, will will use that as the church, right? It's like, man, you should be in church. You should come to the house of God. You should come to Bethel. And they'll be like, well, and they have an excuse. And they'll be like, well, I'll just be in Shechem. I'll just watch a pastor on TV. And it's like, well, that's neat. But, but your living room, that's not Bethel. And I'm not trying to make the church anything special, but, but just grab a hold of what I'm saying. Your, your living room isn't Bethel. Your, your living room is in the house of God. The house of God is where believers are gathered together and worshiping him. So uh, let's pray for those who are struggling with that, who are compromising uh, uh, Shechem for Bethel for whatever reason, and they think they're okay because they make an altar. That's not what God would want. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this evening. God, I thank you for your word. And Lord, for the, the awesome truths that we find in it. And um, Lord, for the interesting verses that we looked at tonight, Lord, with, with Jacob wrestling with you. And Lord, just the picture that we see there of um, the importance of getting alone with you to get stuff done. Lord, the importance of, uh, of uh, not giving in, not, not in a rebellious way, but, but in a in just a prevailing way to say, Lord, I'm going to hold on to you until you bless me. Not an ultimatum, but, but, but holding on to your promises that God, I don't care what's happening in my life around me. Lord, I'm going to stick to you. I'm going to hold on to you because I know it's from you where the blessings come from and I don't care what's happening. And even if holding on to you is rough and it's like wrestling sometimes, I'm just going to stick with it and go through it because you are who blessings come from, Lord. I pray that we would hold on to you. Lord, as we saw Jacob worrying about what might happen with his brother, even though you promised him you'd take care of him, Lord, as all of us in this room are worrying about something, Lord, something that's in your hands, that's out of our control, that's in your control. And God, I ask that we could just surrender that over to you. Lord, that we wouldn't lose sleep over it, that we wouldn't uh, waste space in our mind thinking about it, but we could just trust in you. And God, like Jacob, repeat the promises that you've made to us back to you. Lord, that we are your children, that we are adopted into your family, that we belong to you, that you love us, that you care for us, that we are more than conquerors, Lord, through you. Lord, those are who we are, God, and that's what we need to be praying. That's what we need to be living in. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to impact each and every one of us tonight. Lord, that we would be filled with your Spirit, Lord, overflowing as we uh, complete the rest of this week and gather back together Sunday. Lord, excited to, to hear from John chapter 10. Lord, that we would just love your word, that we would just love people. Lord, that that would be what we're known for. God, thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You guys have a good evening. We still got some more good